And we're moving straight to Iran. The Obama administration announced yesterday that it was imposing new, more limited sanctions on some Iranian citizens and companies for violating United Nations resolutions against ballistic missile tests. The move came less than 24 hours after the White House lifted broader sanctions against Iran for its nuclear program, and the announcement was made shortly after a Swiss plane carrying Americans freed by the Iranian authorities departed Tehran. Very, very well timed in that respect. The release of the American prisoners came a day after Iran and the United States concluded delicate negotiations on the exchange tied indirectly to the completion of a nuclear agreement, which saw the lifting of crippling sanctions imposed on Iran for its nuclear program since 2006. Now, this action allowed Iran to re-enter the world's oil markets as of this week. According to some estimates, by the end of the year, its exports may increase by a million barrels a day. So its ships will be able to enter and leave foreign ports, and its people will have access to global financial markets. And with a few strokes of a pen, Mr. Obama and Secretary of State John Kerry released more than $100 billion in frozen funds. So to take a look at what this all means for Iran, the region, and the world, let's take a look at the following report. Break it down from there. Iran has completed the necessary preparatory steps. Expanding the horizon of opportunity for the Iranian people Multinational and national economic and financial sanctions related to Iran's nuclear program are lifted in accordance with the JCPOA. The sense of accomplishment is undeniable. Diplomacy won, and the long isolated Iran is now officially received with open arms as it joins the international community. It's truly one of the golden pages of the history of this country. But this outstanding finale did not come without a cost. Our diplomacy is at work with respect to Iran, where for the first time in a decade we've halted the progress of its nuclear program and reduced its stockpile of nuclear material. While U.S. President Barack Obama was hailing the agreement last week before implementation was officially launched, American sailors were in the hands of the Islamic Republic, which not so long ago tested ballistic missiles without any American opera whatsoever. Now, in light of the release of Americans being imprisoned in Iran, Obama's aim not to raise controversy is clearer, but his strategy is perceived by many as soft-handed. It didn't happen because it wasn't a priority for Barack Obama. Or John Kerry. They know that if you take an American hostage, Barack Obama will cut a deal with you. The reason they let the boat, the sailors go, is because in two days they were getting $150 billion. But suspicion is far from being a trend among the Republican Party alone. Israel will continue monitoring any international breaches by Iran, including the nuclear deal, the ballistic missile deal, and terrorism. Yet it's not only the obligations of Tehran to the world that counts now, but the compliance with the promises they've made to their people. It might have a psychological effect, but everything will eventually go back to where we started, and it might get even worse. That's why I don't think anything special will happen. Throughout the negotiations on the accord, leaders and diplomats have been stressing time and again that the nuclear issue is unrelated to all others. But now, as this threat has been ultimately thwarted, it remains to be seen whether Iran maintains its stance on human rights and terrorism, or will it seize the opportunity to become more liberal. See what this all means. I'm joined in studio by Dr. Raz Sim from the Alliance Center for Iranian Studies at Tel Aviv University. Good morning to you. Morning. With us also, I-24 News Middle East analyst and contributor Jake Orchafter, usually in Cairo this day, this morning. We're very lucky to have you in studio. Good morning to you. But before anything else, let's go to Washington, D.C. We're joined via Skype by Kelsey Davenport, the director of the Nonproliferation Policy at the Arms Control Association. And it's very good to see you, um, uh, Kelsey. I think last we spoke, you were in Vienna. Firstly, it's a new dawn. Good morning, Tehran, as the world was saying yesterday. What does this mean this morning of the day? To those people, what would you say to those people who are saying this was a bad deal, this is a bad deal, the world right now is destabilized? And what would be your answer to that? You know, I would say that now that Iran has implemented its commitments under the deal, it's further away from nuclear weapons than it's been in the past decade. And I would also add that now every element of Iran's nuclear program is under continuous international monitoring, and all of its facilities are subject to short notice inspections. Inspectors will also be able to access other sites in Iran, including military sites, if there are concerns about illicit activities. So I think that this agreement has pushed Iran back from the brink of nuclear weapons and certainly makes the region uh, and better secures uh, international security. 
Yeah, Kelsey, if you can stay with us, Dr. Raz, it seems though, but people are concerned, people in the region are concerned. As somebody who monitors Iran and leave, lives and breathes what happens there from afar, reactions um, over the course of this morning or over the course of the last two days from Iran? Well, moderates are, uh, are happy, of course. Yeah. Uh, Zarif was uh, welcomed uh, in the Majlis in the parliament yesterday. Hardliners, as, as always, are uh, against the deal. I, I would say the, the Iranian population uh, is expecting a real change, but they're uh, quite skeptic, I, I would say this. Uh, th they celebrated the victory of Rouhani, they celebrated the interim agreement, they celebrated the, the agreement itself, and now they celebrate again, but, but they want results. They, they, they want Rouhani when to deliver. When will they start feeling their results? At the end of the day, this is a huge infusion of, of money. I mean, let's face it, it's money. It's all about money. Uh, I think it will take years before the, the average Iranian will feel the, 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 uh, the fruits of the sanctions re removal. Money is going to, uh, to, to go back to Iran right away, right. but uh, Iranian economy is a sick economy, and it will take years to... Uh, I, I saw yesterday some, someone in the website uh, saying, well, we are just back 12 years, uh, to the point we were 12, 12 years, years ago. ago. So it will that, take yeah. years, perhaps not 12 years, but it will take some years to uh, compensate for all the, uh, the short givings of the Iranian economy for, for years. Over the course of the sanctions. Regionally, though, Jake Worch, after everybody's looking at this morning everybody was looking at the, you know the new dawn it does i mean the region is going to change Th that's for sure i'm talking i'm speaking with and the, the region base. changed in the 12 years that we're talking about and especially the price of oil yes and so when we're down to 27 dollars a barrel um you're looking at what the saudis are having to do across the persian gulf about rethinking their economy about getting saudis to work about getting off of oil is the mainstay of their economy. And the Iranians are going to have to come up with a, a, a petrol-free um, pathway for their economy as well. And, and the price of oil being so different than it was going to be when this negotiation started is going to affect where the money that's coming from sanctions relief back into Iran is going to go to. And you know more about how that debate is going to play out inside Tehran than I do. But I would imagine that there are going to be some serious pressures not to get involved in more regional expansionism and adventurism yeah. because of this uh, Sunni Shiite political, you know. I agree. The problem is that regional policy in Iran, as you, you know, is carried out not by Rouhani, not by Zarif, by the revolutionary guards. So we will probably see some struggles. I saw yesterday that the budget of uh, revolutionary guards, uh, according to the bill submitted yesterday by Rouhani, uh, has been decreased. So we will see some uh, power struggles going on between the revolutionary guards and the president. And, and Kelsey, if you're still with us, I want to ask you though the question on the mind because we are broadcasting obviously from the Jaffa port, and everybody, uh, you know, some some countries, specifically Israel in the Middle East, would say, why should we? We trust the Iranians. That's what the Israeli administration is saying. That's what a bulk of Republicans are saying. Why should the Iranians be trusted? Even though you know this is you know the, the argument, it's a better world there now. We've curbed their nuclear program. But why should they be trusted if they were shown to lie over and over again in the past? Well, I think the beauty of this agreement is that we don't need to trust Iran for it to work. Iran has indeed cheated in its commitments on the past. And because of what the international community has learned about Iran's past nuclear activities, they've managed to build a monitoring and verification regime that, that will ensure that if Iran tries to take those steps in the future, they will be immediately detected. And it's important to remember that it is not just going to be international inspectors in Iran weighing every gram of uranium and tracking every part for every centrifuge, but the national intelligence communities, those in the United States, those in Israel, those in Europe, are also going to keep Iran's program under a microscope, and they're going to provide further assurance that Tehran isn't deviating from the deal. They're also not going to let Iran off in the case of violations. You know, we've seen already that the United States has put new individuals and new entities on the designated list because Iran conducted ballistic missile tests last year that were in violation of its UN commitments. Okay. So I think okay. we'll continue to see these actions going forward to show Iran that there will be a price for noncompliance. Well, I would hope. I want to thank you for joining us from DC. Seal, so in studio, 10 seconds, one quick point. Quick point about nukes. And that is seconds. UAE, yeah. Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt are all developing nuclear power. They have a pet pathway to, to have nuclear uh, weapons as well. Oh, and that would be scary all the time we have. Now the news, stay with us.